Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about the compiler pipeline. So I'm going to walk you through every stage of a standard compiler. So this is what it looks like. Uh, we have lexing, parsing, semantic analysis, optimization, and then code generation. Let's start by the beginning. So lexing. Lexing is about going from uh, the, the text, the input, your source code, basically, when you're dealing with programming languages, uh, to a list of tokens. You can think of tokens as a word. So what's the source text from the perspective of the computer? It's just a bunch of letters, characters, really, one after the other. It doesn't really mean anything. And the first step into extracting meaning from the source uh, text is going to be to chunk it in words that have meaning. So if you take the example here, you see that I have uh, chunked the text into simple, simply characters. But really, the unit of meaning here is that we want uh, to recognize that foo is a variable, equal and plus our operators, bars are variable, 42 is a number. So that's how it should be chunked. So nothing really mysterious here. Uh, you just go to text, from text to uh, tokens. Now the next step is related, it's called parsing. In parsing, you take as input your tokens that you have, but you don't think of it, of them, as a list of tokens, right? You don't think of it as food and equal and bar and plus and 42. You think of it as, well, I want to uh, add 42 and bar, and I want to take the result of this addition and put it into foo. So what you really want, ultimately, is a, a tree like the one we have here which gives you the hierarchy of operation, right? You have the addition on the one hand and the variable on the other hand, and then you want to add them to one another. This uh, whole tree is called an abstract syntax tree or AST. Now we'll see later why it's called that way, but you can see that it's a tree. You can see that it deals with syntax and the abstract part just means it does not have to follow the structure of a gram. So that might be a bit mysterious, but we'll see in uh, follow-up lectures what that means. So, yes, the first thing, actually, the parser does is extract the structure. Oops, sorry about that. It's not the, actually the only thing that it does. It also does another thing, which is that it catches syntax errors. So I've put you two small program fragments here. The first one is syntax error because it's missing parentheses that you should have here in Java. So that's a syntax error. This is also an error because uh, Y here is not defined in the program. But that's not a syntax error. The parser cannot catch this. So moving on. Yes, so something that's important to say is that lexing is optional. It's possible to do parsing without lexing. That's called a scannerless parser. And also, uh, people often refer as parsing to actually lexing and parsing both. So sometimes the distinction is not made. Let's move to semantic analysis. Semantic analysis is a series of checks that you perform on your abstract syntax tree once you have it. The two main types of check you'll do are name binding and type checking, and then you'll do some others, other stuff as well. So type checking, as you might imagine, is verifying that the types used in the programs um, are in accordance with the values that are being used. So if I define here a function called print that takes a string as a parameter, when, when I call the function, it has to take a string not the integer, otherwise it's that type error. So that's very obvious. Type checking um, is also concerned with question of type inferencing. So um, if I defined a variable x and I assign that to foobar, what's the type of x? It's string, of course. And if I assign to y the result of uh, my function, while the result of that depends uh, on the return time of my function. But to know uh, the type of these variables here, 
f to the type of the right hand side. So that's that's what what's called type inference. But actually, there isn't really uh, a difference between type inference and type checking, because even if you specify the type on the left hand side here, you still need to independently uh, infer the type on the right and then check that it is the same thing. So really seeing this here um, doesn't let the compiler do any less work. Actually, it has to do more work because no, not only does it have to figure out what's the type of the thing on the right, but it also has to uh, compare that to the actual type. So there's one step in this small example that's not quite clear. If I want to know the type of uh, Y here, then I need to know the return type of my function, which is to say that I need to know what my function is. And this, knowing what my function refers to, is the purpose of uh, name binding. So I've put you a small example here. We have a class called whatever. There's two function. The function MacGuffin assigns y to the result of my function, like we did before, and then we'll just return some comparison here. Uh, and my function takes an int, uh, int argument and returns it. So uh, the first thing you have to do is actually to look up my function. We can actually see that it's defined here, right? And because this function returns int, then we know that uh, the variable y has type int. Then we can do uh, the check here. You know, comparing an integer with an integer is obviously allowed. The type of that whole thing is a Boolean, which matches the type of the return function, so we're happy. Uh, another check that happens in here is that we check that 42 is indeed an integer. So this whole program type check, and we're very happy. So name binding and type checking are really um, complementary, right? You cannot really do one without the other. And this example is very simple, but if you start having something like classes and inheritance, then it becomes uh, much more complex. So semantic analysis would also do some other checks. So an example is uh, checking the flow of your program. So here we defined a function that returns int. Um, we need to make sure that whatever the program does, it ends up returning an integer. So you can see there's an if statement here, and the else branch does not have a return. So that's obviously an error that we need to catch. Our example would be if you take a uh, programming language like Java that has access control. So you can say that function or classes are public, private, etc. You need to verify that uh, private functions or, or data is not being accessed. So that's another thing you, you can do in semantic analysis. So moving on, we should normally talk about optimization. But at this point, it's important to, to make a remark is that this pipeline is just one possible compiler pipeline. It's in fact a pipeline that would be used for a, an old school C compiler. So you do semantic analysis and uh, you get a tree. And then you're going to run some uh, optimizations in that tree. And once you're done with that, you're going to generate code. Actually, for a C compiler, that would be machine code. So that's one possibility. But there are many other possibilities. For instance, uh, some more modern C compiler would perhaps do some optimization. Yes. Um, oops. This is bound to happen a lot. Like. Uh, I haven't figured out the, the key bindings already. So you have your tree, and you might uh, do some optimization directly on that tree, but then you'll generate some machine code and you'll perform uh, optimization directly on the machine code. Okay. Give me a second because I've broken my setup.
looks like we're back in business. Um, I was saying that you run some decisions in the tree, then you generate machine code, and you will run optimization machine code. Now, an example of this architecture is, uh, like I said, some more recency compilers, and in particular, uh, those that use LVM. LVM is the low level virtual machine. This is a very, very bad name because LVM is not, in fact, a virtual machine. I don't know why they call it that way. That's just wrong. So just don't think of it as a virtual machine. We shall see what a, a virtual machine actually is in a minute or so. And uh, what LVM does is that it generates um, something called IR, intermediate representation, and it runs the optimization on the IR. Uh, and then at the end, it generates machine code for the actual machine. So that is being used with C compilers, but also other kinds of uh, compiler that target machine code. So Rust, for instance, could work with LVM. I don't know if it does actually, but uh, it could. So let's take another possible architecture. So in this case, after we got our tree, uh, and we verify the semantic analysis, we generate bytecode. So I've called this bytecode. What I mean by this is some kind of machine code that's not going to be executed on a machine, but instead it's going to be executed by a virtual machine or it's going to be transformed. So actually, uh, I could have called the LVM IR, the intermediate representation. I could have called bytecode as well. And basically every language as its old name for that. So in LVM is IR. In um, C sharp, it's called uh, intermediary language, IL. And, and bytecode is a Java term. In this course, we're going to use, um, we're going to learn about Java bytecode. So I, I like to use the term bytecode. Uh, but if you use other terms, that's fine too. So in this example, we generate bytecode directly from the tree. And then we feed that. Uh, to a just-in-time compiler. What does this mean? What's a just-in-time compiler? Well, actually, you see there's a big divide here. It's a big wall. All of this on the left uh, happens when you compile the program before you run it. And everything on the right, right, all these things, that happens when you run the program. So the compiler is just-in-time because you compile the program as you're running it. So it's just in time because literally before running it, you're compiling the program. And uh, as part of that, you perform some uh, optimization and you emit the code. So this is what uh, C-sharp does. So C-sharp, when you compile a program in C-sharp, you get an uh, exe file, but that's actually very deceiving because this exe file actually contains bytecode or intermediate language, which is then at runtime uh, compiled to actual machine code for your machine. Uh, you can make it even more complicated. And this is actually what most languages of virtual machine do, like uh, Java, JavaScript, uh, just Ruby. I'll talk about this shortly. So basically, uh, you see that it's exactly the same as for uh, C Sharp. So everything to the left here. All of these is done at compile time. And at runtime, this time we go into a virtual machine. What's a virtual machine? A virtual machine is a machine that runs um, bytecode, basically. So it runs something that looks like machine code, but is not actually machine code because it does not run an actual machine. It runs a virtual machine. And um, it's a, uh, a virtual machine with a just-in-time compiler. So when this executes code, the virtual machine has a choice. It can either interpret the code, which means that it will run it. Uh, it will run the bad code as though it was a machine code, but it will not generate actual machine code or it can convert it to actual machine code in a code generation step. Now, like why would it do this? Why would it ever uh, choose to interpret the code when, of course, machine code is much faster? Well, there's a good reason. 
if it does this, it can uh, collect profile information, so it can see what's actually happening uh, when it runs a program. And based on this recorded information, it can optimize the code better. If you've ever heard the claim that Java can be faster than C in some program, um, this is where it comes from. It comes from a runtime profiling of the code that enables better optimizations. This is pretty much the state of the art of um, optimization in compilers, let's say. And it's a very popular way to do it. So uh, the Java Virtual Machine does this, the V8 JavaScript compiler. So that's what you get in, a, well, I should say the V8 Virtual Machine. That's what you have in a Chrome and in Node.js. Uh, Truffle Ruby, so that's the language I'm working on. Truffle Ruby is a bit more complicated because it runs on the JVM, but then there's a framework called uh, Truffle on top of that. And the compiler has been modified to be GraalVM, so it's a bit difficult, but uh, the key idea is the same. And if you use the PyPy uh, implementation of Python, this is also the kind of architecture that you get there. Of course, you can make it difficult. You can also make it more simpler. Like who says you need to do any optimization at all, right? And um, we can distinguish basically two types of simple architecture. The very simple one is just, just interpret the tree directly. Don't do any bytecode that you can interpret in a virtual machine. No, just take the tree and uh, visit that with a tree walk interpreter. Language don't tend to do this because it's very slow. But uh, Ruby used to do that before version 1.9. So uh, that's the proof that even doing something as inefficient as this is not, uh, does, not preclude, uh, does not preclude your language from being successful. Uh, the other thing that language will do that is a bit more common is to actually generate bytecode and then run it in a virtual machine. So that's what uh, the C Python does. So that's the, the standard implementation of Python and also the standard implementation of Ruby, which uh, is called YARV, yet another Ruby VM. Um, so I've bolded the tree walk interpreter because we're going to talk about this right now. In the project, this is actually what we'll ask you to do in our first time, because it's much simpler than uh, generating bytecode or doing things like that. And at least it will ensure that you have something that runs. And actually, it, it is an interesting learning experience to write these tree walk interpreters. So what are those tree walk interpreters? So I, I gave you a small example program right here, which is composed of uh, two statements. So we just uh, do some math, assign it to a variable, then print the variable. And then I've, I've uh, transcribed the AST here. So we have our program, uh, we have the assignment, the variable foo, we need to look it up to see what it refers to. We have our addition, nothing difficult here. Uh, for the call, we need to look at print, and then we need to look at foo and then actually do the call. Uh, also, print as a functional language, so it also has uh, an AST for uh, its body, right? I haven't represented it, but uh, we need to know that it exists. Okay, so for uh, the various lookup that we have to do, the, these lookups are, are done in um, something called a scope. You probably know what a scope is, but here to make it simple, I just made a single scope that's foo and print. So foo is a variable, so it refers to some storage in memory. Uh, print is a function, so it refers to the definition of function with its uh, it's the AST that we did not represent. So actually executing this, how does it proceed? So it, it proceeds in a recursive way. So we start the program, we're gonna execute the assignment, we're gonna look up foo, so we, we get allocation in the store. Then we're gonna do the addition so that we evaluate the numbers, we add them up, and then we store um, the result in the store. Then we do our call. For that, we need to look at the print definition. We look at foo since we stored, uh, you know, here 
94, we're going to evaluate to 94. And then we do the call. And actually, this is just evaluating the AST here. And uh, in the scope, actually, when we're evaluating here, there's going to be a parameter as that refers to the value here. So that's a, an overview of the tree walk interpreter. Hopefully it helps you a little bit to understand how that works. Um, and then we get to code generation. So it could be machine code generation, could be byte code generation. Um, it does not make much difference. I don't have much to say about this, but for flavor, I want to give you a small example. So I have here a simple squaring function in C. And here is the x64 assembler that is being generated for that function. So basically, it stores the, the stack pointer here. The um, num, the num parameter is being stored in the EDI register. Then it pushes that on the stack. Right, this is a stack address. Then it takes that uh, stack address. Well, it takes the value at the stack address, puts it in the X register. It multiplies this register by itself here. And that's pretty much it. Like uh, implicitly, the value return is the one that is in the e, well, EAX register. Uh, this is a lot of, uh, this is very inefficient. This is what you get when you compare with that optimization. If you compare with optimization, you get the thing on the right, which is much more reasonable. So like I said, EDI as the, the number the parameter, you just put that in EAX and then you multiply EAX by EDI. Uh, the result is stored in EAX and then you return and that's it. Uh, you obviously don't need to know uh, machine code in this course. That's not the point of the course. I just thought that was an interesting example. Oh, and um, this example I take from this website, godbolt.org. Uh, on this website, you can play with uh, sample C programs and you can see the machine code generated for them. And you can try different compilers, you can try different optimization levels. So if you're interested, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, the second example is the same small program, but this time in Java. So we prefer to stick that into a class. Uh, and we generate the, this whole affair on the right. And there's a lot of data because, uh, you know, it notices a class. It actually has a function, which is the uh, constructor of the class that is implicit. Uh, it records line numbers and stuff like this. Uh, but actually, what interests us is uh, this part right here. That's the definition of the function. And um, so the x64 assembler that we just saw is register-based because the machine is register-based. If you don't know what a register is, I probably should have explained, but it's like the fastest level of memory on your computer. Now the Java bytecode, on the other hand, is stack-based. So there's no notion of uh, registers. Everything is pushed and popped from a stack. And basically what this iLoad one here does, it says, well, take the first parameter and push it on the stack. And then uh, this IMO here says, take the first two values in the stack and multiply them, push the result on the stack, and then we return. So interesting that it's a different way to work. Uh, yeah, we will learn more about uh, Java bytecode. Uh, towards the end of the course. And there will be an option, if you want, you can uh, compile your language to Java bytecode. So finally, we come back to optimizations. Uh, we're not going to be very, very thorough on optimizations. But I want to give you a sense of what the most common optimizations are. So you can optimize, like we said, on, on the, the tree or on the target code or intermediate representation. So there are different ways to do it. There are two types of optimizations that are going to be your bread and butter. They're going to drive most of the gains that you get. And these are first inlining. So inlining is just 
taking the definition of a function and putting it in another that calls it. So you replace a function call by a function definition. And the second one is partial evaluation, which is uh, propagating known information. And the most famous member of that family of optimization is, is called constant folding, where you propagate the value of a constant that you know. There's a few other things like loop and rolling, but I don't want to talk about them right now. I'm going to give you an example of inlining and partial evaluation, though. So we have this simple program. We have uh, this full variable, which is always false. This function with a condition uh, either returns something long and boring, or we call to p with parameter true and we add one. And b itself, uh, if the Boolean is var, it returns 42, otherwise it returns 52. So um, we're going to be optimizing the function a. And uh, what we could do is that we could inline, okay, we could inline uh, something long and boring, and we could inline B. The problem is if we do this, and if we don't actually enter the first, um, the condition here, then uh, this could be bad for cache locality. So I don't want to enter the details uh, today, but basically, if you've seen in computer architecture or something, how cache work, if you put a whole lot of code here and then foo is false and you need to jump to the code that matches this, you're gonna incur a cache miss. And so it will take time to retrieve the, the code basically. What we can do, however, is that we know that foo is always false, okay? So knowing that, we can actually get rid of this condition because we know it's never going to be entered because foo is false. Now, once we've done that, now we can inline b, right? So actually, that's what we do here on the right. We take this definition here and we pull it here and we replace bar by the parameter true. Having done this, now we can actually uh, constant fold true because this is always true, right? And so it's always going to be 42, right? This is what we do here on the right. And then we're left with just 42 plus 1, and this is going to be 43. So we could go from uh, this whole mess here to just return 43. And what's interesting to note is that there is really like um, a complementarity between inlining and um, constant folding and uh, partial evaluation, right? Like if we, like I said, if we just inline here, that might have been detrimental to performance actually. But once we've eliminated the if, then it's a no-brainer to inline the B. And also, um, in B, if, say we had optimized B, we couldn't have done anything because we don't know if bar is going to be true or not. But what happens is that when you pull this into A, you replace bar by its actual value, which is true. And so now you can optimize the body of B, which you could not have done if you did not inline it. So Basically, inlining is super important because it enables new optimizations. And sometimes there's a cascade effect where you inline something that allows you to do some uh, partial evaluations to eliminate some branches and stuff. And then that makes it easier to inline more things, etc. So that's why I said that these are the bread and butter of optimizations. And I think that's it for today. Yes. Um, see you next time. We're going to talk about formal grammars and lexing, so going a bit deeper into parsing. Uh, take care and see you next time.